My name's Karen Stahl. I work for Cancer Council Queensland and it is my um, great pleasure and privilege to be uh, chairing the first, the first uh, lot of sessions today at uh, today's Skin Cancer Consumer Forum. And um, again, big thank you for coming along. Uh, we have uh, developed, I think, a, a great uh, round of presenters for you today. We're going to hear from some of um, internationally the uh, world's best researchers, a range of health professionals talking about treatments, but also support programs available. And of course, we're going to hear most importantly from consumers and their experience. Just like to make a uh, particular mention that this is a uh, a partnership today forum with uh, Melanoma Patients Association, so it's um, great to be working you guys as well on this. I'd uh, like to uh, introduce our, our sp first speaker for the morning, we'll keep um, rolling along, is uh, John Heron. Thank you very much for coming along. So John um, has uh, a very long history in the world of um, melanoma, and indeed the Queensland Cancer Fund's Melanoma Project Research. He was the first research fellow in 1963. He was also a visiting surgeon at um, PA Hospital in 1968 and then in 1975 became the senior surgeon at the Marta Hospital. And um, John uh, said to me this morning that he likes to be busy and active, so he's also currently the chairman of the Australian National Council on Drugs. Um, so please um, welcome John to the stage to talk. <laughs> Thanks very much, Karen. Uh, it's good of you to come on Sunday morning, particularly with the test on at the moment. Uh, Mark Smithers told us the other day that 50 years ago, Australia won the first test. He didn't tell us it was against South Africa, but uh, there it is. Um, I'm very privileged to be with you, not only because of my longevity, uh, but uh, I've watched the story of melanoma all my life, because once you're involved in this area, uh, it becomes uh, almost an obsession, I suppose, to see what's going on. But uh, the originator of the Queensland Melanoma Project 50 years ago was an extraordinary man called Neville Davis. He's now deceased, unfortunately, and uh, it's, he became a very close friend of mine. He was a very modest man. He, he never talked about himself. When I look back on it, um, I gave one of the eulogies at his funeral, and when I look back on it, he never talked about himself. But uh, not only did he found the Queensland Melanoma Project, but he also founded other projects, the colorectal project as well, which became world leaders in their field. So I'd like to start my presentation for you to look at Neville Davis. I discovered uh, when I was working on what to do about this uh, presentation, uh, see if I could find anything about Neville because uh, Although I was with him on his deathbed, he didn't mention that uh, 25 years ago, exactly halfway between the foundation and now, he'd done a television interview. And uh, I'll show you three or four minutes of that to give you an idea of the calibre of the man. So I think if I press the right button. This is it. You can see how music and technology has improved. Search. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder how that first started. Well, uh, it started really in 1962 uh, in the changing room at the Princess Alexandra Hospital uh, when I said to my senior, Sir Evan, uh, later Sir Evan Thompson, uh, the Queensland Cancer Fund has collected a million dollars uh, for research and I think we ought to uh, do some research. And he said, well, what on? And I said, well, what about melanoma? You don't need to x-ray it uh, because x-ray facilities were poor. Uh, and really, you don't need much laboratory facilities. Uh, and uh, we could 
document and study melanoma. And in fact, the surgical staff of the Princess Alexandra Hospital uh, submit and, submitted an application to the Queensland Cancer Fund and the Queensland Melanoma Project started in July 1963. That was the first research you'd done, in fact? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and how did that go? I mean, that was quite productive. Well, uh, it was, it was uh, a clinical, pathological and epidemiological study uh, of a d disease in a, uh, uh, on a population base. Uh, we were well advised by Professor Douglas Gordon to make a population-based study, and that was one of the most important inputs uh, to the project. Uh, we documented all we could about the patients who got uh, a melanoma. We documented uh, all we could about the tumour uh, we documented where they resided and whether they'd had sun exposure and so forth. And we recorded the treatment and the follow-up. Uh, the research uh, has been called pedestrian, and I suppose it is pedestrian, uh, but uh, as the result of that research, uh, we found out uh, a lot about the uh, condition. And uh, uh, this has meant uh, that in Queensland melanoma is diagnosed more early uh, than it is anywhere else in the world and the results of treatment are better. Well there it is and, and things have improved obviously in the last 25 years but uh, Neville collected aphorisms and uh, he bequeathed them to me actually and one of his favourite ones was it's amazing what you can achieve in life as long as you don't mind who gets the credit. And Neville was always like that. He was always promoting others. Um, my story started uh, in 1963 at the beginning. Uh, you've got to understand the structure of surgery in those days. There were two teams at Princess Alexandra Hospital, both headed by knight who, people who ultimately became knights, Sir Evan Thompson, who was the senior in that unit, Neville Davis, who was junior, um, Brux Georgeson, who was an assistant, and then on the other team was Sir Clarence Leggett, um, uh, Clem Windsor and Sam Malik. And the cases were allocated according to that. Now, uh, I was in England, my wife and I had a couple of kids, another on the way, and I was at that stage, if you ever lived in England or you're English yourself, you think this is the centre of the world, I think I'll stay here, you know. And uh, then I got a letter from Sir Evan Thompson, I didn't know Neville was involved at all. Uh, would I like to come back and be a research fellow on melanoma in Queensland? And uh, I rang him up and I said, I don't know anything about melanoma. And he said, nor does anybody else come back. So I did and I started as a part-time uh, research fellow and I looked back uh, on it um, at the time, you know, we can't compare incomes and that, but uh, I assisted Evan Thompson and Clary Leggett in my spare, and Neville in my spare time, uh, and then ultimately went on the visiting staff at Princess Alexandra Hospital after five years. Uh, I didn't have a day off for five years, but not that that worried me, but uh, I was at, in that era, it's hard to believe now, 50% of the patients that presented with melanoma had advanced disease. And the commonest operation I did in that era was a block dissection of the axilla because most of them were on the backs of males, as you know, and, and sometimes uh, blocks of the groin and sometimes neck, because that was the treatment at the time. Uh, it's now totally superseded, as you would be well aware. But uh, after five years, I thought, I've got to get out of this, because nearly 50% of the patients who presented were dying. And I didn't believe, or I couldn't see that it was going to change, really. I mean, I didn't have enough foresight to see that there would be dramatic improvements. After we'd uh, done three years of collecting this data, uh, we'd collected by then, I think, about 2,000 patients. This was, uh, looking back on it, it was, um, uh, everybody was involved voluntarily. The pathologists were checking the pathology, the general practitioners were notifying us, the hosp public hospitals and the private hospitals were notifying us of patients that were admitted. We knew that melanoma was common in Queensland, but we didn't at that stage realise it was more common here than any other country in the world, and still is, by the way. But you'll hear about that later when Mark Smithers speaks. So 
we decided, we then started looking around to see if there were comparable studies in the world, and they weren't. We were the first in the world uh, to do this. And um, I'll try and show you this. We keep there. We, we decided to um, put an, I don't, don't expect you to read that, by the way, just relax. It's a, it's a you can't. Um, it's not your eyesight. The, um, we published in the Australian Medical Journal uh, on the 9th of April 1966 a plea for comparable studies if, if in Australia, basically, because we needed, we, we had no grounds for comparison as to what we were seeing and what we were collecting and other states in Australia. Subsequently, it's been shown that Queensland, dare I say it, is the melanoma capital, capital of the world. Uh, because after that, we also published in The Lancet, which was then regarded as the premier medical journal of the world, in the English-speaking world anyway. And um, we did the uh, same story. We, we said we'd been collected, collecting cases. And these were the first 400 patients that we analysed. And uh, as you'll see, the uh, things have changed a little bit, but not a lot. Melanomas are most common on the backs of uh, males and on the legs of females. And that hasn't changed, I believe, as you'll hear from Mark. The, um, we did that, and um, it, everything sort of happened after that because other, other places in the world started doing comparable studies. And there are comparable studies now being done everywhere in the world, I suppose, where there's a fairly high incidence of melanoma. But the importance of this really was that we then had a baseline to see what was occurring in population studies. Uh, and there need to be population studies to see, to, to see about the uh, influence of things. The, um, the real heroes of all this, though, and here we go again. I want to go on to the next slide. Hooray. The real heroes of this program, were the, it was then called the Queensland Cancer Fund. And there were only a small number of people. Uh, David Lambert, who's on your left, uh, who was a senior businessman in town. I can't remember whether he was um, Myers or, or T.C. Burns, or David Jones for that matter, TC, whether he was um, Myers or, or T.C. Burns, or David Jones for that matter, T.C. Burns out of existence now. Uh, Sir Charles Wanstall, he, didn't have the, he was the Chief Justice. And there's been a tradition of judges uh, being chairman of the Queensland, uh, Queensland Council Fund was then, and a fellow called Bill Rudder, and Bill was the CEO of the Queensland Cancer Fund. And their first grant that they gave, uh, it was formed in 1962. Money was raised by milkmen. You used to get your milk delivered in those days, those that are old enough to remember that. Uh, and they left envelopes, please give money for cancer research. And they raised a million dollars, the equivalent of a million dollars in 1962. And the first grant um, of $500 was to the Queensland Melanoma Project. Subsequently, there was more money that they gave, but uh, they were the real heroes, I think, uh, those three people. I think that uh, Charles Wanstall was a friend either of Clary Leggett or Evan Thompson or, or both. They were all knights. There weren't that many of them in those days, and uh, I think that's how it came about, that they convinced him, uh, Charles Wanstall, that, that money should go there. Sorry, I've gone back. Oh, I've gone too far now. I really need a technologist. What we, uh, I wanted to show you that the first, um, no, not that. No, I just the one that. underneath, yeah. The first um, melanoma conference was in 1966, uh, sponsored by the Queensland Cancer Fund, as it was there, a first in the fight against melanoma. And they're very proud of it that they'd put up the money, but it shows you their foresight that they did that. Uh, in 1966, three years after we started. And it was the, not only the first uh, in Queensland, it was the first in Australia. And we drew together all the, all the people that were interested in this. There was a, a, a lot of people who were concentrating on treatment and um, in the other uh, hospitals in Australia, particularly a fellow called Jerry Milton in Sydney. And so... Um, they were more involved in treatment. We were really involved in diagnosis. And as Neville said there, the big thing that we did really was to um, alert the public about changes in moles that were occurring. I, I still laugh about, and my wife was reminding me last night, that uh, Neville and I used to go down to the beach 
and run melanoma clinics on uh, up the north coast or down the south coast. We'd put over the surf life-saving thing. If you've got a mole you're worried about, um, we pit, we detected a few melanomas actually on on Sundays, and it was quite good fun really. And you know, we put this, did the slip slop slap business, and we had big hats on to say people, you know, it's a bit. Soul destroying when you see television at the moment, all the people baking in the sun there. And I, I, all I think of is they're cooking melanomas or skin cancers because Queensland is the skin cancer. One in the uh, capital of the world, too, one in three gets skin cancers in the lifetime. So it's sun exposure, obviously. So I'll leave it at that. Um, on Thursday here, uh, I was succeeded, or Rod McLeod uh, joined me after three years, and then Graham Beardmore, subsequent to that, a dermatologist, they were here on Thursday. When I was in England, just before I left, uh, three Nobel Prize winners, or two had, hadn't got the Nobel Prize at that stage, James Watson and Francis Crick, uh, got the Nobel Prize for working out the DNA spiral, you know. Uh, and, but, um, Peter Medawa had got it in 1962, and he was the originator of understanding immunity, and, and that led on, of course, to transplantation. The three of them were on British television, and they were asked to write down on a slate, and they each had a little slate and a chalk, how long it would take before we find the answer to cancer. Now, 1963... John Fitzgerald Kennedy was, hadn't been assassinated, that was the year he was, it was uh, but he was in full flight. He'd announced that we were going to put a man on the moon uh, before long. Uh, science was exploding as a result of DNA, uh, you know, understanding DNA on the basis of things. And everybody thought that we'd conquer cancer before very long. And they were asked how long we thought they thought it would take. And in my... Uh, innocence, I thought, oh, it'll be about 10 years. And then I thought, no, I'll hedge my bets. I'll say 25 years. And they all held their... And then they were asked to show their sim slate simultaneously, and they all had 100 years, 50 years ago. Now, I think we're going to prove them wrong. I'm still an optimist because there have been so many advances, particularly in melanoma in the last 10 years, that, uh, and the interest that's shown and the interest that you people are showing too, you can spread the word as well that we need to spend more money on research in this disease because it, um, it can be conquered. Uh, I mean, stopping it is the best thing, of course, so speak to everybody, don't go sunbaking, and if you, you know, there's no ultimate protection from uh, ultraviolet light. Uh, I know the effect of things, you know, 95% and so on, et cetera, but you've still got that other problem. And, and actually, it is, it is not direct sunlight. That's the extraordinary part about it. I actually operate on a patient who had a melanoma of the gallbladder. Couldn't get any sunlight in there. And, of course, it occurs in every other organ of the body apart from the heart. So uh, it, does, it, it is still... The mystery is still out there. Now, I'll give you a little bit of hope. There's a fellow called Paul Morn. Uh, Paul was a patient of mine going back probably um, 40 years ago. Paul presented uh, originally... Uh, with uh, an amelanotic melanoma on his scalp at the age of 23. Nobody diagnosed it until he got the secondaries in the neck. And then we blocked the second his neck, we took his scalp off, um, and uh, then he turned up with secondaries all in the abdominal wall. And I removed those. And then he turned up in, with, with his fiancée. He was then probably about 24. They wanted to get married, he wanted my advice. And I, you know, what could you say in this situation? Abdominal wall, secondaries, secondaries, and then a pro big primary on his skull. And uh, I said, Paul, I, I think you should put it off for a year. His fiance burst into tears, he burst into tears, I burst into tears. I thought, this is terrible, you know. I saw that they, they took a great deal of notice of me. I saw their wedding photograph two weeks later. <laughs> So he disappeared, and I thought, years when he never turned up. I tried to get in touch, he didn't turn up, and I thought he must have died. Some years went past, and I was travelling Queensland doing lectures around throughout the state, um, and I'm a Catholic, and I went to Mass one Sunday morning, and uh, some fella came up to me, and he had three little kids beside him, and he said, uh, do you remember me? And I nearly fell into one of the gravesites. I couldn't believe it was Paul Mort. And I said, uh, Paul. <laughs> he said, oh, I shifted up to Bundaberg. Forgot to let you know. 
Uh, thanks very much. And uh, anyway, uh, the good news is I said, how did, how did this come about? And he said, well, I went to the Morris Brothers at Ashgrove. He said, and I had great faith. I prayed to Mary. He said, and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And they didn't recur. So I don't know whether you're agnostic or religious or whatever, but there's certainly something there. And I see there's a lecture on, on psychosocial uh, attitudes uh, sometime in relation to melanoma. The point of telling you that story is that Paul Morn's still alive. Uh, I asked his permission to, to use this name. He said he'd be happy to. Uh, but uh, so you never know. A melanoma is an unpredictable disease. And as I mentioned, there are so many advances in the last 10 years. I'm convinced that uh, Peter Medawa, uh, Francis Crick and James Watson are going to be proven wrong. Thank you for listening to me.